Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So welcome, um, although we are really sad to see that Jessa is going to be leaving us um, at the end of the week, we are really delighted to actually get to, a chance to hear about her research. Um, so this is Jessa and she is a uh, PhD student in, at Rutgers and she'll be presenting on her summer project. Thanks, so I spent the summer studying a really interesting group of people and they're interesting ostensibly because they have a particular set of practices for modifying their bodies. And these practices, it's important to point out, are different than what you might consider conventional body modification in four ways. They are unusual, they're typically very painful, they're illegal or quasi-legal, and they are almost always permanent. So in contrast to something that's fairly socially accepted, like pierced earlobes or moderate tattooing, we're talking about things like ear pointing to make them look elven or um, tongue splitting or um, subdermal implants of magnets or silicone or the voluntary amputation of limbs and organs. And although these procedures are in and of themselves, by the way, I'm going to call them EBM or extreme body modification for short. And although these procedures are in and of themselves interesting, if I've done my job right, at the end of this talk, the questions that you'll have won't so much be about the people or the procedures, they're going to be about community and secrecy and privacy and perceptions of the availability of information about EBM. So although I've just said that EBM is sort of, you know, I could study secrecy anywhere, right? I mean, I could study it at MSR. You can imagine sort of a project about intellectual property and decisions and whether and with whom to share information about what you're doing. But although I've just said I don't want to focus too much on EBM itself and certainly not why people get it, there are three reasons that I have for studying this particular group of people. So the first is one of my main concerns is about how these practices translate from an offline to an online environment. And um, the body modification community has a really long history for a bunch of reasons that I won't address right now of being online. And one of the websites that I'll be referring to as me scene, it started in 1994, which is a really long time in the internet age. So this project is really useful if you're interested in taking sort of a longer approach on how people have been navigating not only online and offline, but online over a period of time. The second reason that I have for investigating this group is as technology um, ethnographers, ethnographers of technology, uh, one of the things with which we struggle is sort of like what happens to the body when people go online and research things. And when you have people who are looking for information about how to modify their bodies, that question is very present um, automatically just by studying this group of people. And the third reason is that, I mean, I remember when I was being interviewed, I said over and over, I felt called to do this research. And I still don't know exactly what that means, but it's, it's accurate. You know, I really care about this community um, personally as well as theoretically. And one reason I realized I wanted to study it so much is that I was sort of terrified if someone else did it, I would just be so angry at the mistakes that they might make, and I would be angry at myself for not having done it. So those are the reasons that I have for choosing this particular community. Um, Again, my focus is gonna be on secrecy and privacy. What I wanna do actually, once I get through some of the initial slides setting this up, is really focus on the areas that surprised me when I was doing this research. Um, things that maybe I expected to have happen because I've participated in this community in various ways, and sort of when those moments didn't quite happen as I thought they would. I'm gonna introduce two theoretical constructs very briefly that I'm going to be using to interpret um, my data, starting off with information poverty it's originated by Alfreda Chapman, who's sort of my patron saint of human information behavior. Information poverty, um, she has six propositions, and it is about um, trying to figure out why people in non-dominant groups do not treat information the way that we would expect. And she says, first of all, methodologically, you have to look at people's lived realities, and you have to place their actions in a social fabric. And once you do that, you're sort of able to understand why they behave in unusual ways. There are six propositions. Uh, proposition two is missing. Another thing I don't really have time to address is, but if you're curious, proposition two is about class. The issue of class um, would be fascinating to talk about in, in detail right now, but I don't have time. But 
that's what's missing. The other five propositions, I think they relate in really terrific ways. They're about deception, risk taking, secrecy. Very pivotally, it's about not believing outsider information, even when it might be more accurate. Um, or what an outsider went, might perceive as more accurate. So I think information poverty as a construct does a really good job of describing the experiences of people looking for information on things that are risky, rare, and stigmatized, which is EBM. Even more briefly, I'm going to talk about um, Thornton's issue, construct of subcultural capital, in which she adapted Bourdieu's cultural capital to talk about how subcultures determine levels of membership within, as well as relationship metrics between communities. Uh, these are a couple of quotes that I found in looking for subcultural capital. All I'm going to say is basically I did a pretty, what I hope was a pretty thorough lit review, looking for instances where people talked about tattoos and piercings in terms of subcultural capital. And I found actually less than you might think. So I'm excited about that, that I can sort of participate in that scholarship. In terms of terminology, I'm going to use uh, secrecy to talk about keeping what we do secret and privacy to refer to keeping what I do private. This is just sort of my little model, but it helps me organize some of the things that I'm finding because I think these things are different and it's good to be clear. So when I'm going forward, when I'm talking secrecy, ours, privacy, mine. I started the summer with these two research questions. What are the social norms and technological protocols in the body modification community for keeping EBM secret? And two, does having access to information about EBM result in a feeling, uh, in feeling a sense of belonging to a community? And we'll see what happens to these research questions over the course of the summer. Um, two main ways of doing this project. One was 18 interviews with people who have obtained, are actively looking for, or perform um, EBM across the country, actually in a couple in the English-speaking world, plus some participant observation, hanging out in tattoo shops, and um, going to an annual camp out in the body modification community just this past weekend. This is what it looks like when I code transcripts in InVivo. If you're curious about InVivo, I love InVivo, and I could talk about it for days, but um, I won't be talking about it too much here. So um, this is from my friend Sean, um, who I interviewed for this project. And this is exactly what I had expected to hear going into this project. Um, my need for secrecy is just to keep us safe. Keep it secret, keep it safe is the ethic here. If we just keep things private, we have less of an ethical responsibility to the people who are going to do it anyway. If we protect these things, the government's not going to stop looking at, start looking at us. The legislation's not going to start looking at us. We're not going to get some mentally fluid person who decides to do something irrevocable to emulate us if we control the information. I feel like I could write an entire book just about some of the things that Sean is saying here because it's kind of amazing. It's really a, a rich, layered set of accusations and assertions and beliefs. Um, but one thing that was great about it was I was like, oh, this is exactly what I thought. You know, like we have to keep this information to ourselves, otherwise people will find out about us. The authorities will find out about us. Oh, and by the way, we won't be a subculture anymore. But it turns out secrecy is actually a little bit more complicated than this. Because later in the interview, Sean went on to talk about a failure to keep secrets, for which he blames himself, but also technology and the media. As a researcher, it's kind of a downer when you're doing your first few interviews and about secrecy and body modification, and someone just says, oh, I don't really think we keep secrets. I don't think we have secrets anymore. So that's why you do more than a couple interviews. Um, because Sean's been in the scene for a really long time. So how do newcomers to body modification, especially EBM, experience information? And do they think there's a sense of secrecy? Short answer would be yes. So I have some quotes from participants about how hard it was for them to find information. They wanted information, and they didn't know where to go. Um, I really love that first quote where it's sort of like, yeah, man, you find something, you find out about something, and you either luck out and you get a good practitioner, or you don't, and you have shitty work. And then that's just that. Which, you know, that's kind of crummy if you're going to a restaurant. It turns out that the restaurant wasn't very good. But again, this is about body modification. <laughs> Irrevocable changes to your body that's just a matter of luck, because you didn't know where to go for authoritative information. So in its own way, this was actually also surprising to me, because what I had expected to hear was a rough approximation of the following. Something like, I know, let's say I live in Boston. I know who in Boston does these rare procedures. Maybe it's one or two people. And I won't tell outsiders, because it's important to me that the Boston scene has one or two people who can perform these things. And we'll keep it secret. We'll keep it safe. 
that didn't really happen um, anywhere that I was investigating. What happens is there's four or five internationally known artists who do these things. And if you live somewhere that's not where they operate, um, basically San Diego, Phoenix, Toronto, New York, and um, there's a guy in the Netherlands, plus Sydney. If you don't live in those places, what you do is you wait, like it's your favorite band coming to town. You wait for them to go on tour, because they go on tour, and then they just come through, and then you get the procedures then. That's, that's how you do it. And we don't know who in your local area performs these things. Sometimes I knew in Boston where someone should be going, say, in Tucson, but you know, is that, I don't know what, first of all, I don't know what my ethical obligation as a researcher is there. But second of all, what that says to me is that there's a lot that's going on at the surface, like these very well-known practitioners, and then maybe a lot going on underneath that people don't get to that second layer of information. So again, if you lived outside of an area where these very well-known piercers operated, you're going to feel very excluded. Conditions of information poverty are going to be evident. And for these people, information is precious, difficult to come by, interpret, and authenticate. I want you to contrast this to someone like Rhoda, who, after years of getting fairly heavy work done, feels absolutely comfortable not having a lot of information ahead of time. By her own admission, she rarely researches procedures themselves, leaving any questions until the last minute. And again, we're not talking here about ear piercing. We're not talking about getting your navel done and being like, oh, I guess it turned out OK. We're talking about things that are very, she has very heavy scarification, and she has tongue splitting, and she has a lot of really heavy work. And she just says, look, I've spent years cultivating relationships with these people, and I trust them completely. I love that she uses the word cultivate, because it actually refers to putting the work in to get to know people and practitioners in the community, which is her word rather than procedures. And it also, again, raises the, the sort of specter of community, which is sort of haunting this entire, entire thing. So Rhoda's approach is basically, I'm just going to get to know the people. And then it, once I trust them, I'm, I don't have to look for information on procedures. I can, just, I can just go there and be like, hey, I want this, and then feel comfortable getting done what she wants to get done. There are other uh, complications to sort of the overall model that I'm trying to sketch. For example, despite Sean's concern that people shouldn't be sharing information with others, people like Raskin mentioned an obligation precisely to provide people with information. I feel like it's your responsibility if you're modified and have information to provide other people with information. It's a good thing to be an ambassador for modifications. Another, I mean, if you take this a step further, it's an invocation of community. It's my obligation to provide people with information. And we, I also saw people phrase this directly in terms of the body. I want my friends to come to me for information because I don't want their, this is a direct quote, I don't want their bodies to get fucked up. So with obligations to provide information, the question becomes what kinds of information do we provide and to whom? So here we have Rhoda saying, when so many people are already freaked out that nothing's safe, nothing's sterile, and you're going to get hepatitis, saying something negative like that, she was talking about how she had found something out about her pr um, procedure. She wished she'd known ahead of time, but then she felt like she couldn't provide it to the community. Because then, I mean, if she said that, it would be hurting the cause more than it's helping it, which I think is why most people wouldn't want you to say that unless they're already in the community. And even then, we don't hear as many horror stories because I feel like a lot of people just think it's going to hurt the movement more than it helps. So this is a complex account of decisions and consequences for openness about information. On the one hand, Rhoda's talking about a desire to put information online specifically about her experiences with a particular modification. At the same time, there's a countering pressure against disclosure because it threatens to, quote, hurt the movement by playing into fears that modifications are uns unsafe. Yet when Rhoda includes the waiver, unless they're already in the community, it indicates that whereas with outsiders, openness about potential side effects would be negative, with insiders, it's acceptable to express doubts or concerns about procedures. She also seems to be indicating that the cause or movement is something people want to be pushing, even as this someday way undermines the subculture qua subculture, by which I mean the more people that we tell about this thing, the bigger the subculture gets to the point that don't we have to worry that it's not a subculture anymore. And indeed, some of my participants said, no, it's not a subculture because too many people are already doing it. So in terms of deciding how and with whom to share information, people reference things like noting visibly shared tattoos or picking up on a familiarity with vernacular. So if someone says, oh, hey, did you get your conch pierced or stretched? The fact that you know which term to use signals, hey, this person is already in the modification community. 
I feel comfortable sharing information with you. So at first, I was like, great, vernacular. This is a very concrete way of how we decide whether or not we're going to share information with someone. If you say, hey, do you know a shop where that sells internally threaded jewelry, for example, which is widely acknowledged to be safer than externally threaded jewelry, then you can say, maybe I'll share different information with you than I would have if you just said, hey, I'm going to get a butterfly tattoo on the small of my back, <laughs> which I can say because I have one. Um, so I was really optimistic about, you know, okay, vernacular, this is good, this is, this is concrete. But then I went back to Sean's interview, um, and I realized I'm sort of wading towards Sean a little bit, but he has some great comments, so I couldn't help it. So he's, he's saying, people who aren't into suspensions know what a suicide suspension is now. They know the names because of the massive media overexposure of it. And we're the media. That's the irony, is that we used to try so hard to control the outside media's perception of us that we've become the media. That's what social networking has allowed us to be. And we still use no ethical guideline on what we're going to show. But what he's saying is now he finds himself being at an event where he wants it to be secret on some level. Some really cool things are going on, some procedures that are new and exciting, and he's really happy that it's happening and that the community is alive and vibrant in these moments. And then he finds himself tweeting it or videotaping it and uploading it in that moment, which Setting aside the question of publicity as publicity, there's also the question of Sean raised, look, if we pub post this right away, we don't have time to curate this. We don't have time to say, oh, six months later, we found out there were horrible after effects. Oh, guess what? This person you know, had some things that you should really know if you're going to consider yourself informed about this procedure. There's no time for that, which used to be built into documenting the procedure itself. And the fact that he blames social media for it, even as he has built his own blog repeatedly, like he's built several blogs in different instantiations about the social, about the body modification community. There's some real tensions there, and he's aware of his own. He implicates himself in in talking about failures to keep these kinds of secrets. So I started this project with two main research questions, and literally I was lying in bed one night, and I realized I was asking the wrong question. Um, that really, what I wanted to talk about wasn't so much this, it was this. How does an individual's construction or understanding of community shape perceptions of information and or secrecy? Which isn't perfect, but it's a lot closer to what I'm, to what I'm studying. And what I get from this is that there's a tension between wanting to keep things secret, because this is what the subculture dictates in order to avoid authorities, but also because it preserves themselves as a subculture, and wanting to display information, where displaying information includes online documentation as well as offline just moving through the world as a very heavily modified person. So I had a participant who said, um, I offend people just by walking on the train. And he does, because he's very heavily modified. So sometimes people want to display their modifications online as well as offline um, for purposes of gaining standing in the community, but participants also spoke about wanting to give back to sources that have been useful for them in the past, or wanting to provide information specifically because they had problems experience, um, they had problems finding information on EBM. And this is where subcultural capital comes in quite clearly. So first of all, it comes in, there's sort of uh, another great thing Sean said is he called checklist modification, where it's like you're really modified if you have full sleeve tattoos and stretched ears and scarification and you've suspended. Then, and he has this great phrase, you're collecting weirdness. Well, that's pretty clearly subcultural capital, but that's not the kind of subcultural capital that I want to study. What I want to study is more, I gain subcultural capital on the one hand by documenting my experiences so that other people can gain from it, but I also can gain subcultural capital by keeping secrets in the way that I know the community wants me to keep secrets. So that's kind of complicated. Privacy actually became a really good way of understanding some of these tensions, by which I mean it's useful to look at the actions people take to share or not share information about EBM on, say, Facebook versus me scene, which again is that um, body modification online resource. It's a wiki, it's a blog, it's a social network site, it's all of those things. So deciding to share some pictures on Facebook versus maybe all your pictures on MeScene, not to be on Facebook at all, only to be on MeScene. These are decisions that you can see as concrete moments where people are taking into consideration what they're going to share and with whom. At the same time, I'm really still curious about a couple of things related to secrecy. Sort of like, Unraveling secrecy, why it isn't, according to Sean, successful. There's also a sort of 
perhaps false nostalgia for when they were better about keeping secrets. Um, the question about what to do about the fact that technology, and specifically social media, social media is enriching on the one hand and destroying community, protecting and hiding information, connecting and erecting barriers between people and practitioners. It's somehow doing all these things at once. And I have a lot of great um, accounts and narratives of these things happening. I just have to figure out what I want to, how I want to frame these questions. So I'm going to leave it there. Um, I'd welcome ideas of where to go, what sparks your curiosity, what you think I need to unpack, um, what can be set aside, and what questions I might be able to answer with these interviews that I've undertaken. So thank you. Mary Gray. Thank you. I, mean, I, really, I really enjoy your translation or the transformation of your research question. So it's just a beautiful case of saying how uh, this is about something bigger than the technology, which you know is near and dear in my heart. Um, my question is for Rhonda when she was saying that she was more interested in the relationship, like building that, that cultivation of the relationships, and that's what guides her as opposed to necessarily knowing the details of the procedure. Mm -hmm. But then she, at a different point, it sounded like she was aware of a procedure that didn't necessarily go awry, but she had learned a different way to do it. So how, how is she complementing both the trust building and cultivation with the information gathering she's doing for those alternatives? Where are the alternatives coming from? So Rhoda's kind of great. Um, she had a question where I was, I was trying to over and over ask like, so how do you research? How do you research? How do you research? And she, at some point she was like, look, I don't research anything unless I'm going to do it to myself, right? So she's done one procedure to herself and she was like, I researched that to bits and pieces. But if it's actually just, you know, walking into a shop, I just go, man. But then she documents it online and then the question becomes, how do people respond to that documentation? So sometimes people respond to that documentation really positively, like, thanks so much for sharing this, this was great. And other times people are like, wow, that's gross. Or like, oh man, that, that looks terrible. Why would anyone do that to themselves? And it's at that point that she starts to worry about what happens to this information once it goes online in terms of the community. So she says, yes, this is information I would have liked to have had ahead of time although she never engages in practices that would actually allow her to get that information ahead of time. Like setting that aside, I think she's kind of trying, she's more interested in talking about how do we create a space online where people can contribute in ways that are useful. And she is very aware of the fact that there are judgments to be made about like, no, you can't ever flame a tattoo or pierced, piercer, a well-known piercer or tattoo artist online like that. That does not fly. That's a custom, you know. So she's in that same vein. She's also saying, "I feel like I can't document certain things in this way because the community wouldn't like it." Yes. Jess, that was great. Um, I really like what you're doing with secrecy as a plural and privacy as an individual account. I thought that was fantastic. Um, I guess I'm really interested in your question that you're posing around individual constructions or understandings of community. Because it seems to me, and I'd, I'd be really interested in your reflections on the people that you've spoken to, in terms of about both how they bound the community, you know, what makes you in the community and outside. So collecting weirdness is a really nice way of thinking about it, but are there hierarchies within that? So like, is it just about more mods equals, you know, you're more serious and therefore more in? And what are those kinds of hierarchies and how do they operate? And do those hierarchies relate to this idea of secrecy? So I'm, uh, I definitely struggled with the term community throughout. And I had a really great meeting with Alice earlier in the summer being like, help me figure this out. Um, and while I was interviewing, uh, I made sure that I never, there were two words I tried really, really hard not to use until someone else used it first. And the first was secrecy and the second was community. So I tried to sort of just listen and then when someone said subculture or community or whatever, I used that word going, going forward. And obviously I got really excited if they used the word secrecy without me telling them. Um, because I was like, great. Um, but about the issue of community, um, Community subculture scene, I like community the best. Um, I think there's a lot to do with it. Is it a community of practice? Is it, um, we finally, I was talking to Alice, we discovered sort of like maybe we can call it an interpretive community because what they're doing is 
sort of um, using these practices to sort of craft um, craft a self-image, um, but not just a self-image, um, to, to make changes to their bodies that make how they move through the world reflect who they want to be. Um, so I think the vast majority of people that I interviewed will tell you the scene is very open. You know, we, I don't need someone to have two-inch lobes for me to talk to them. I'll talk to anybody. You know, what's important is that they're open and accepting of body modification. But you see that, and at the same time, in the same interview, they will say, yeah, you know, I was reaching out to someone and I wanted information about what was happening, but I got the sense that, you know, I wasn't modified enough for them. The very last question I asked in every single interview was, if you could tell the modification community one thing about itself, what would that be? And it was almost always, you know, we need to be less judgmental, we need to be, you know, more open to people within the scene, there's all these scene points, you know, that kind of, that kind of rhetoric. So clearly both things are going on at the same time. And even in my own observations as someone researching this community, I, have, I do not have work that I would consider extreme body modification, but I do have some pretty heavy work. It's just not visible. So people who know me and know the work that I have um, are very welcoming. Um, and people who don't need to be informed sometimes before they will open their arms to me. And that's a weird position to be in, but it does say to me, hey, we do have levels of sort of gauging first off and in a way, I, I, you know, it's easy to be sort of critical of that. Like, how can you set yourself up as a subculture that wants to be more open to practices of the body? But at the same time, it gets kind of annoying for people to have to feel judged all the time, especially with people with very, very heavy work. So in a way, you, I, am, I became aware again of how much these decisions do have effects on people's daily lives in a way that I can understand them making snap judgments. So what I'm trying to say is if someone feels discriminated against in their jobs hunt, you know, people talked about not being allowed into restaurants or bars because they have very heavy tattooing. Um, I can understand, you know, looking at someone who's very visibly modified and just being like, feel you, brother, you know, like that kind of mentality in a way that on some level is like, yeah, you're discriminating against someone who doesn't have as visible work. But on another level, it's like they really do share some of the same sacrifices that they've had to make. Brings together those ideas of visibility and secrecy. So it's like how much can be seen and how much is hidden. It seems really central. I was gonna similarly really like this distinction between secrecy and keeping what we do secret, privacy and keeping what I do private. And I'm wondering, um, I'm wondering about differences or potential differences between people who had procedures done and learned about procedures and research procedures but didn't do the procedures themselves versus practitioners who were doing the procedures and because it strikes me that there's in, in the we versus I distinction that you're sort of making there's a sense that a practitioner might see what they do as a craft and a skill that is sort of something that they give to the community or give to people and then share with the community through an act of, of, of making and doing but that it's sort of their technique or their, it, it's what distinguishes practitioners among practitioners. So you can you know, help develop different kinds of expertise and say that's my work, that's not my work, that's somebody else's work. So that's a kind of a, it almost seems like a, a sub-sense of secrecy versus privacy within the community because people who are only having procedures done but don't do it themselves may actually feel sort of less ownership over the skill or the craft, mm -hmm. even though they might actually feel quite a bit of ownership over the work, right. because they're literally embodying the work. And I'm just wondering whether you saw within the practitioner community, like another bifurcation of it to sort of say, like people who don't do their own work are less good members of this community versus people who I mean, work at this point. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Uh, so the, the issue of practitioners was interesting because I hadn't actually set out to interview as many as I did, so I probably interviewed about five. Um, and they were fascinating because, um, I mean, in hindsight, this is going to sound kind of dumb, but I hadn't really thought about the role of competition in secrecy. Mm -hmm. So when you ask a practitioner about sharing information, they're like, oh, I'll share with someone as long as they're not, they're not my competition. And there's a sense of indignation when people do share, won't share information even though they aren't competition. You know, like, 
a couple of my, uh, the participants who were younger and practitioners were like, you know, on the one hand, they would be like, I can email, you know, it's, the community is great because I can email whomever and, you know, uh, yeah, they'll write back to me. You know, I'm thinking of this one participant, Gabriel, who was saying he could reach out to this very prestigious, you know, practitioner and we'll have an exchange. I've met him. He knows who I am. But when I asked him what was the most useful resource for researching split tongues, he was like, oh, well, my mom's a nurse and, you know, I use her nursing textbooks. What that says to me is that maybe he can reach out to this practitioner and get an email back, but it's not, if that information is actually about procedures, it's not useful. Um, what's useful is his mom's textbooks. As an aside, weird number of very heavily modified people whose mothers were nurses. Um, <laughs> there's a whole project to be done there, um, <laughs> but not doing it right now because I do not have the stamina to do it. Um, but I invite all of you. Um, so there was that tension, which I hadn't anticipated. So that is very much there. At the, it's also a market thing. So they don't want people to necessarily do their own work. Most people are not getting DIY, doing DIY work, by DIY work because there's a subcultural capital for doing it. They're doing it because they have no other options. So they don't know where to go, and they really, really want something, and they just do it online. Um, with the information that they see online, they do it offline. Um, so there's that. But um, the practitioners themselves, obviously, they need a market. Like, they need people. So I mean, on the, if they were smart, they wouldn't want the cachet of doing it yourself, because then they wouldn't have people. There's a, I think there's an interesting, sorry, is there a um, question between community of practice versus a learning community. Mm -hmm. And there's some overlap there, but not there isn't necessarily overlap. So I'm thinking of, you know, if you, if you wanted to characterize it as you know, legitimate peripheral participation and sort of who's considered a central actor and how do you enter in and how do you move from the periphery to the center and what channels are available to you and what opportunities are there, yeah. how does that signal? Um, that's, that's sort of a, a practice-based, that's, that's a role of apprenticing and becoming an expert practice, which is different from learning about the community where you may have no intention of being a right. practitioner. And, um, I mean, apprenticeship is obviously a great word because the practitioners all were apprentices. Like, there's an actual apprentice process. At the same time, there's a great quote that I have um, from this guy named Lazarus who says, look, I got better at researching. You know, uh, over time, I became much more, when I first, you know, when I was first sitting out in this, I was enamored of every piece of information that I found. But since I've had this done, now I'm much more efficient at finding what I need. So there's a level of, there's a community of practice for practitioners. And there's also a kind of practice where you get better at researching, um, which is useful. Um, interestingly, also, when we, sort of your first question, secrecy and privacy sort of collapsed more for me with practitioners than it did for the people getting information. Because they are the ones on the hook. The practitioners are the ones on the hook legally. So at this, on one level, they don't want to advertise, hey, I do tongue splittings, because that's quasi-legal in most states. But at the same time, they need to advertise that they do tongue splitting, because that's the expensive procedures. That's where they make their money. Um, so they also have to negotiate that tension in a way that is perhaps less economically or legally fraught for um, someone saying, I don't want my parents to know I have a tongue splitting, um, but I want my you know, lab partner, who I think is really cute, to know. Um, so do I put this on Facebook? Although, again, there are actual real consequences for people. I mean, one of my participants was kicked out of his house because of his modification. So I don't mean to say that like the decisions about your family knowing can't have real consequences. Dana. So I was really fascinated by, um, I mean, I, I like you, I, I share appreciation for Sean and what he was saying about how we've become the media, right? This moment about what is the shift in these technological spaces that's enabling an increase in sharing to the degree where sharing is the default. And I'm wondering, like, as you, as you think through this and you think through the different uh, folks you interviewed and how they see some of these transitions, how are they seeing what is the reasonable response around secrecy in this sort of new media default sharing environment, right? Because in some ways, the very acts of sharing, which were not highly publicized, become highly publicized just because you're participating on anything from Facebook to MyScene. 
So how then did they like how did that really rework some of the secrecy stuff? And I just I want you to go a little deeper than what you've presented here because I think it's such a fascinating component of it. What I just thought while you were talking is I think that there has been a long history of sensationalism in the scene. Um, so people, one of the things I think Sean is saying is uh, we tried so hard to control the media's perception of us, um, and now we are the media. It was there was a moment where it was like. This is great. I mean, Miscene was really created in order to document everything about the body modification community. Um, that's where it started. So um, I think there was an initial excitement about we can be the ones who control our own narrative for once. You know, we're not being positioned as freaks. We're not being positioned as um, you know deviants or uh, criminals. Uh, we're just people who have these ideas about the body because it's fun, um, and we want that to be our narrative, and we want to control our narrative. So I think that was the initial excitement. And I think there's still um, a vein of that where, and Sean didn't say it, but one of the reasons I think he has his iPhone out is that when he's at events is he wants to be the one with that content. Like He wants to be the one putting that out there rather than it winding up on some site where they're going to call him a freak or call his friends freaks or whatever. So there's definitely that. You know, He'd rather have it be on his page where there's some ownership over it. At the same time, it, he feels like he has some ownership over the scene full stop. I mean, he's been a participant in it for years. So I think to him, if, you, if I asked him, he would say, yes, I should get to post some of this stuff, but I'm not sure other people should because they haven't put in the same amount of time. So those are some of the intentions that are going on there. And I agree that there's a lot more I could say. Um, thanks for the presentation. Can, can, can you say something more about um, how much of the need for secrecy here is uh, driven by uh, external threat, say persecution from authorities, uh, versus a, an internal need of you know being part of a cool community which derives coolness from uh, being secret? Good question. Um, so, on the one hand. Um, Basically, everybody talks about how this is a legal gray area. Um, the practitioners, uh, as well as people who are looking for information. And performing or receiving? Performing. Perform receiving, you can't really get busted. Um, but performing, and the reason you get busted on performing, technically you can be busted for assault. But what's much more common is um, if you provide anesthesia to most in most of the United States, uh, if you get a topical anesthesia, that's fine. But an injected anesthesia, that has to be done by a, someone with a license. So you can get busted for performing a medical procedure without a license. So that's sort of the oversweeping narrative over all this. Now, how many people actually get busted? I don't think it's very many. Where it happens is Arizona and Florida, because those are where old people live, and they have very strict laws about modification, is basically a fact. On the other hand, um, there is uh, there was a fairly well-known case in 2010 in Toronto, which has a very vibrant body modification community, of someone being arrested for performing a um, labia removal on a young woman whose family um, wanted the practitioner um, charged on assault. And that ended in an incredibly tragic way because um, during the court proceedings, the practitioner actually wound up killing himself. So there are cases that are real and that happen in very urban and what you would think of as accepting areas. I mean, I hate to unequivocally paint Canada as a place of tolerance where these things just shouldn't happen, but um, it was sort of a shock when it happened in Toronto. It, it really was, um, because that is a huge body modification place. So all of that was to say, yes, there is a real legal, legal threat. It's not that common. I mean, none of the practitioners with whom I spoke have ever been threatened with any kind of legal action. Um, I think it is very much a sense of we have to keep this secret because we want it to be a secretive community. But people acknowledge, if you push even just a little bit, that it's not actually that secret. When we have shows like Miami Inked and LA Inc. and all of these shows, I mean, how secret is this? Not very. So um, there's that. One other quick thing about legal repercussions is that where you see it most often is actually with immigrant immigrants who want um, their daughters, um, 
So immigrants from Africa and the Middle East who want their daughters to have some sort of uh, genital modification in keeping with indigenous cultures and government, governments being very hostile to that. So that actually gets into really interesting questions about race, immigration, what you can and cannot do to your body. Um, and practic piercing practitioners are some of the only people who are willing to do this. Um, so that's also, that's where you see it far more than in the body modification community proper, at least in my cursory research on this. So. I want to, actually, I'm going to cut this off, um, but anybody can sit and talk to Jessa afterwards about it. But I want to say thank you for fantastic work. Thanks, guys.